Hi, welcome to Multi-Platinum Pro Tools, the mixing DVD. I'm John Merchant and I'll be your host. For the last 20 years, I've had the opportunity to work with some amazing people. Artists, musicians, producers, and engineers of the highest caliber. The Bee Gees, Barbara Streisand, Michael Jackson, Celine Dion, producers like Arif Mardin, David Foster, Hugh Padgham, Bill Ramone, and many, many others. Your songs, even your basic writing demos, are all judged based on the quality of the mix. This video is designed to show you how to build a mix from the ground up. Starting with a mixing template and progressing through equalization, dynamics, and effects. I'll show you some of my favorite techniques and give you the tools that you need to make your mixes compete and win. Aggressive, dynamic, clear, and full. This video will help bring your mixes to the next level. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so we've gone through most of our instrument tracks. Um, the only things left to work on now are the percussion tracks and the vocals. So, um, Right now, I want to um, bring up the just the lead vocal. I'm going to leave out the backings and see what that sounds like. We talked about a little bit before the notion that typically all of our plugins in in Pro Tools on all the audio channels are pre-fader. So our compressor is going to not care about how dynamic the rest of the song is. It just sees a loud thing and it starts to, and smashes it down. That's not ideal, or it's not as musical as we want. So what we're going to be doing today is we've, uh, we set up this mono aux input before to use as our lead vocal mix track. And I'm going to put all of that processing for that track on that mono aux return track. So my typical chain is an EQ, a de -esser. In this case, I'm going to be using the Waves de if that's available. Whoops. Fooled me and have the same name. You know, they're completely, totally, utterly different pieces of software. Um, and then ultimately a compressor. And I'm using um, the de -esser. I actually prefer the Renaissance de -esser, but I find that this one works quite well. Um, um, like, a, like a standard compressor, a de, -esser, a de is a downward compressor, but it's a very carefully, uh, it's a limited one. In other words, all it's worried about is the high frequency content of what it's compressing. So it's listening at a, at a particular band. In this case, we're starting at, at 55 uh, or, or 5.5K. It will listen exclusively to that. And when it sees something above the threshold at that frequency, it's going to start to attenuate that down. And the reason this is great is that in analog recording, uh, analog tape had a way of doing some natural de-essing. It also added a little bit of compression and a little bit of distortion. It's one of the reasons people still kind of like the sound of analog recording. Digital, for better or for worse, reproduces what you give it. And so it, it doesn't give you anything for free. It's one of the reasons that people used to complain that digital sounded cold. It wasn't that it sounded cold, it just was giving back what was given to it. It was closer to being a linear device. As a result, engineers have had to learn to find ways to make to warm up the sound of digital. To my ear, one of the best ways to do that is to really spend a lot of time on the sibilant quality of your lead vocal and all of your vocals. Um, if a vocal is too essy, if it's too sss, it's going to sound very amateurish. It's going to sound like it was a bad mic or a bad singer or poorly recorded or, or it's just not flattering. And once you hear it, You'll, you can't unhear it. It it's, will make you crazy. You'll have to turn it off. And a lot of records, especially once they have been greatly compressed and mastering, you'll find become SE very fast. So it's good to keep a, a handle on the, the sibilant component of your mix early. So with that in mind, let's just kind of reset this all down. The one other thing that you've, I'm sure you've seen is that I put my EQ first and then my compressor. And the reason for that is that it allows me to push up the high end to make the, the upper mid-range or the, or the high end more aggressive without feeling like that's going to get out of hand. It's almost kind of like having a safety net underneath you to sort of, well, you can push this up as much as you want, but we're going to kind of hold you back or, or control some of the microdynamics. And, and as, you, as you push up, if you push up something a little bit more, it may adjust the sound. Now, there are other people who insist that the EQ live after the compressor. There are engineers who have gotten tremendous results doing that. 
like with all of these components, your best bet is to practice. But as a starting point, I would recommend to you that your compressor live after the EQ. It will prevent you from something getting away from you. Um, so let's listen a little bit to our lead vocal and just kind of play around with this vocal chain for a bit. Now right off the bat, the, the one thing that's still kind of bothering me is that the kick drum doesn't feel, doesn't sound great. So I'd like to right now while I'm here, maybe just play with that a little bit. Let's see what it's doing. Okay, so I think it's time to um, start working with the EQ, and though in this particular instance, I'm going to be looking to EQ for clarity to try to get rid of some of the muddiness. The way I prefer to do it, and we'll just listen to a single instrument so you can really hear it clearly, is to start with the with the the thing that's adding the extra mud. Usually, that's in the the lower mid range or in the in the bass. Um, and the way I prefer to do that is by pushing up that range um, far more than you ever would, plus 10, plus 12. If, it's, if it just goes to plus 15, I mean, that's a lot. You have to be careful that you're not going to overload your speakers or, or overload the output of the channel. But what you can do is push that up, sweep around until you find the place that's a problem, and narrow it, narrow up the, the bandwidth, the Q, to, so that it's as surgical as possible, especially when you're cutting. Um, typically, if you're removing frequencies, you're going to want to be a little more careful and use a more narrow cue, whereas if you're boosting, you probably want to use something of a wider cue. So let me show you. Let's go back to our stock setting, and let's just go for a, an explore. So to my ear, it sounds like there's a little too much information in that region. So we might pull that back just a little bit. And while I'm here, I'm also going to go searching for um, where the attack is on this kick drum. So same deal. We're going to push this up a bit. Right in that neighborhood sounds pretty close to me. Now, it doesn't mean we're necessarily going to have that much boost, but it's nice to know that that's, we can get a smackier kick drum sound if need be. And as I pointed out before, if an individual instrument doesn't sound um, musically, musically accurate on its own, but it works in the overall mix, then it's doing its job. Listening to a track in solo isn't a fair way to judge whether or not it's correct. Um, you're better off to listen to it in the grand scheme of things. So let's listen to it sort of in the whole kit. And you can hear that little bit of extra attack makes it step, step, step up a little bit. So it comes across, translates better. So um, I think that's going to make it more exciting. 